So now, ladies and gentlemen, live and in colour, it's Mr. Wayne Lovejuice. The other day I produced a movie Had a cat with an interesting trappy People said that the YouTube algorithm Really aren't that happy If a channel only broadcasts once a week So we decided we could text ya Whenever we've got a piece of news in our new book Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. For those of you not in the know, every Saturday afternoon for about half an hour, and every Wednesday evening for about half that, we bring you a miscellany of hard science, weird shit and surreality. What do you mean you don't know what surreality is? Well, I think we're going to have to ask Captain Phenobulax the Magnificent to explain. Surreality is what happens when Father and Uncle Richard get stupid and put on silly hats and masks. Those of you with long memories will probably recognise that that piece of film which Captain Peanut for Nobilax the Magnificent, aka the Orange Cat, just showed, was a brief excerpt from a scurrilous movie I made about 24 years ago. Am I going to go into any more details? No. But if you want to, you can find it on YouTube. However, it's now to do with me, Gov. And they've also got now to do with the subject of this week's show, which is all fish. Now, all fish have been known for an awful long time. They were first described by a guy called Peter Ascanius, who was a Norwegian and Danish, Norwegian half Norwegian half Danish professor, back in 1772. There are now known to be two genera and at least three species of all fish. But whereas once all fish were thought to be seriously uncommon, now it seems that they're actually anything but. They're actually quite common. They're just found in places deep in the sea where most people never look. All fish are also, or were once known, as the king of the herons, because for some reason which remains obscure, they used to sometimes be found as bycatch when one was hunting huge schools of, or is it schools or shoals? Shoals of fish, isn't that? Schools as whales. Huge shoals of uh, herring. And they would occasionally catch a or fish alongside them. And the oarfish, which has that wonderful crest on its head that looks a bit like a crown, became dubbed the king of the herrings. In recent years, various peculiar claims have been made about the prescience of oarfish. For example, look at this documentary made in Sri Lanka. Now, I've decided to conduct an experiment and I have managed to obtain a balanced sample of English womanhood. Hello! And I'm going to ask her what she thinks about the various claims that have been made about oarfish. First of all, Isabel, do you believe that oarfish can predict the future? Here, yeah, we'll have to go to the footwell of the stairs. And second, Isabel, what do you think about the widespread belief that oarfish can predict earthquakes? He's busting our kid. So there you have it, the great British public have spoken. Well, as far as the first query is concerned, 
can authors predict the future? I have no idea why anybody would ever think that they could. I only learned about it when I was looking for copyright free film of authors for this episode and I found this Tamil documentary claiming that they can or at least investigating the concept that they are able to foresee the future. As I am not proficient in speaking Tamil, in fact I'm not anything in speaking Tamil, and I even had to look up the name of the language on Wikipedia just now, I cannot tell you what it is they are saying. If there is anybody who can speak Tamil who would like to look at this um, F little excerpt for me, please contact me in the comments below. But on to the next query. This is far more complex and far more interesting. And it goes back to some of the roots of Japanese folklore. Ryago Jo is the Dragon Palace Castle is the supernatural undersea palace of Ryujin, or the Dragon God in Japanese tradition. It's best known as the place in fairy tales where Yurashi Motaro was invited after saving a turtle, where he was entertained by the Dragon God's Princess Otohimi and his minions, but when Yurashima returned back to land after he thought what was a few days, centuries had passed. According to Japanese folklore, the slender orfish Rachelescus Rosselli is known as the messenger from the sea god's palace because it frequents the waters around the sea god's palace and acts in a similar way that angels do from heaven in Judeo-Christian mythology. And between December 2009 and March 2010, unusual numbers of the slender oarfish appeared in the waters and on the beaches of Japan. And people believed that the appearance of these are said to portend earthquakes. After the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, which killed over 20,000 people, many pointed to the oarfish from 2009 to 2010 as being supportive evidence to build this myth up. Now, the real vector of this myth has been the internet, because it's a very obscure old Japanese myth that nobody would have painted any attention to it at all if it hadn't been for the fact that an over-jealous reporter once a few oarfish washed up on Okinawa Beach decided that they needed some sort of a hook to hang the story on and went back into Japanese folklore and found the idea that these oarfish are the messengers of the undersea dragon god. And from there, the whole thing prospered. A few years later, oarfish were found on the coast of Peru. And again, the story proliferated across the internet that these oarfish were the portents of an earthquake. By the way, in the original Japanese stories, as far as I know, it's just the portent of a natural disaster, but it's now become portent specifically of earthquakes. And so when there was a mild earthquake, everybody said, yes, I told you so, it's all down to those pesky oarfish, and we'd have got away with it if it hadn't been for those pesky oarfish. And so the idea that oarfish are <coughs> portents of earthquakes and possibly even something to do with the seismic activity that causes them has proliferated across the world wide web. Remember that the internet is theoretically at least the greatest human discovery since the wheel.
And what do we use it for? We use it for sending pictures of cats, naked photographs of people whom we don't know, and bollocks of our orphish starting earthquakes. So, why did I decide to use this episode at this particular time to talk about Japanese myths surrounding orphish? Well, it's simple. Have a look at this. This arrived in my inbox the other day, courtesy of Miss Maxine and from Miss Daisy and from Richard Muirhead. And all of them were fascinated by these wonderful pictures of an oarfish alive and swimming naturally in its natural habitat. Because if you compare this with all the video that we showed you earlier, those oarfish were in shallow water swimming horizontally and most of them were dead or dying on a beach. Whereas this oarfish, despite the fact that it's wounded, and we'll come back to that in a second, swims upright. And it was only early this century, so only less than 20 years ago, that we discovered that oarfish in their natural habitat do swim upright, which possibly, depends on which way you look at it, possibly could explain some sea serpent sightings like that. But oarfish have been used for years to explain sea serpent sightings. And although they are fascinating creatures, we still know a surprisingly little amount about them. This one was filmed and photographed off the coast of Taiwan in the middle of July. And one of the other interesting things about it, apart from the fact that it is one of the few times that they have been filmed healthily and alive, even though the people who filmed it reckon that the creature was ill and dying, which is why it was in such shallow water, is because it has wounds on it, which have been diagnosed from people who know things better than I do as shark attack wounds. And it has been put on the internet, and I am neither confirming nor denying or endorsing this because I not only don't know, but I wouldn't know where to start looking. But it has been claimed that the pattern of the attack wounds on the side of the oarfish, which were, by the way, what would have made the creature ill and go into sh shallow water, according to the scuba divers who first photographed it, the pattern of these wounds does not compare properly with any known species of shark. I don't know if it's true, I don't know if it's not true, but it's certainly an interesting thing and food for thought. I'm going to be back on Saturday. What am I going to be talking about on Saturday? Well, in part, we're going to be talking about Yorkshire sea monsters. But we're also going to be talking about some other stuff that probably will involve Richard on the Isle of Man and Miss Isabel doing some sort of Jeff the Talking Mongoose dance. And so you really, really don't want to miss that. Do you, Mr. McCrinnan? Because if you're going to be there watching me, Mr. McCrinnan, I'll be seeing you. <laughs>